fine. I hope you all had a uh, great weekend. Pumble will be back uh, starting tomorrow. Let's take a look at what we got going on. Obviously, a lot of crazy stuff happening right now, mainly surrounding the storm. Helen and I don't always like talking about potential, you know, market issues with stuff like that, uh, particularly because things are going on. We will talk about that a little bit today, but obviously, you know, sending a lot of thoughts over to the people affected by that. Uh, even here in St. Petersburg, um, anyone who lived on the beach uh, most likely lost uh, their homes. That's all the way up that coast, uh, starting roughly from our area um, through the Big Bend and now, of course, North Carolina, Asheville, uh, completely destroyed. We could talk a little bit about that going forward. Um, kind of the human impact and then also uh, what some of the uh, economic impacts of that could be as well, giving deference to the situation. Uh, the composite currently is off about 0.25%, trading $18,075. That Dow Jones Industrial, uh, still above the 42,000 level, trading at 42,128. Uh, the dollar staying pretty steady at that, one, uh, that 100 level. We still are up in the uh, upper range of 100. Now, we've had some times in the session, essentially, that you dip down uh, to those those really shallow $100 areas. Um, but it looks like we're probably going to be trading in these uh, bounds for quite a while, specifically given some of the things that Powell was talking about uh, going forward with uh, the Fed's economic policy. Uh, you have crude oil, very interesting, at 68.32. This is coming down, and we've been seeing it come down at the pumps a little bit as well. This is on the back of actually, you know, decreasing... Uh, output from America over the past few months. Obviously, there's a lot of issues going on with China. They're trying to figure out ways to kind of float their economy um, and stave off any kind of massive correction. This is being done through like stimulus package. Uh, they're easing um, barriers to, to, to home buying. So if we can see some recovery over there. You're going to see crude oil kind of go up, right? Uh, let's look at the ES. Mini right here trading at 5,780 and that gold contract at 2,650. Dipping down a little bit off from that high, uh, total all time high of 2,708. China, again, of course, has uh, really been driving the purchase of this. Um, there are some, you know, kind of considerations as to why they're doing this. What is it, de dollarization? Are they trying to kind of protect themselves from something that uh, is occurring over there now? Uh, what it is essentially or what we do know right now is that they are buying a ton of it and that is really floating this gold price uh, and they tend to hold it as well. Copper still staying pretty strong. That copper future contract still above the 380 area trading at 450 right now. Of course, it's been like floating around uh, this kind of low fours, high threes uh, for quite a while. Uh, the Russell futures off about 0.25%. Silver trading down a little bit, trading at 3131 uh, let's take a look at Disney, actually, because I was happy to pull up my personal portfolio today and see that it wasn't just shooting it in the foot. As I always say, okay, macroeconomic output outlook is looking a little better for them. And if you kind of look at this chart here, you can see it's probably going to try to move back towards that gap. Most likely the 107 area. You have a general consensus of about 110. Um, we'll see what shakes out for them. Of course, you've had just really this entire year starting in April. Uh, just a complete burn down here. Now, this isn't on a ton of volume in any capacity. Um, so, you know, we need to get some volume at least if we're going to try to move up to test that gap, you know, probably over the next month or something like that. Um, and it, if it can, you know, breach out on some decent volume, maybe we have a new trading range developing. So we're taking a close look at that. I'm at 95.82. What can you ask for, really? Especially if you've been a bag holder for a long time and bag holding meaning that you're you're not... Uh, profitable at that certain point. Uh, now you're starting to see some people get into that. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I asked myself this question too, right? I'm at a point now um, where I was holding Disney for a long time. It was super profitable. I took some off, but I wanted to hold it in my portfolio because it's it's Disney, right? And you want some stuff in your portfolio that you can keep for a long time. Obviously, it will keep generating uh, cash flow. Over this past year, and really there were some fundamental issues you know, with Disney, with the streaming and all of that. A lot of people you know, we're having uh, they're increasing prices to get into the park, so on. Um, these aren't just, you know, <laughs> day traders or whatever. Uh, maybe they don't like it. There's something more attractive. I mean, there were some big institutional issues with it. Um, and I'm asking myself, you know, do I sell this thing now? I'm profitable because I don't like how it's been behaving. And I think a lot of people are thinking that same thing, right? If you, you get that move up to the gap, you do run a risk. 
I think in a lot of other stocks, maybe not the case with Disney, but you run that like, I'm out of here. I'm done. This is half a year that I'm sitting under, you know, that's a hundred dollar mark where a lot of people probably bought it, you know, above 100 um, just because of the sheer velocity over the past few years with the stock. Um, and so I think you run that risk with other stocks. With Disney, I think more people take the approach that, that I have with it, um, which is they want to keep it in the portfolio because they believe on the long term it's positive. Just in the short term, uh, it's not doing super well. Uh, you have JP Morgan off about 0.52%, Lucid off about 0.84%. Um, all of the EV companies um, getting a little bit shaky today, especially with some stuff with China. You have Tesla off in a minor way, about 0.89%. Again, you're moving way higher on lesser volume, right, than you came down with. And then Rivian is getting smoked uh, for sure. They got downgraded a little bit to overweight, right? And so you're trading off about 3.2%. Now, this is, if you guys have listened to me before, uh, I am, you know, a, a Rivian stan. Uh, this is where I start getting like, what the heck's going to go on here, right? This, comp this stock is reacting way more negatively uh, to, it's just much more sensitive to any kind of news uh, regarding EVs uh, than, say, like Lucid or Tesla. That makes me a little nervous. I'm still a big believer in R2. I think once they get that out, they can get profitable, which it seems like they're still on track to. That's good, right? They have a bunch of money they can continue to burn to get to a point where they, they really are profitable. That's coming through VW. And then, of course, they have that Amazon deal. Those all seem great for the company. It's just at this point, it really is a bet, right? If you believe they can get profitable at the end of this quarter, the Q1 of, of 2025, I would say this is a great time to get into it, right? If you're a little bit shaky on that and you think they're going to need a few more years to do it, this this can be pretty perilous, right? I mean, obviously, we're pre-profit you know, we're, we're, we're pre -profit here. Like low, negative PE, you have a market cap of $11 billion. That's getting shaved off from a market cap of like $18 billion at the top. So... Everything still is with them, right? No new news has come in that's necessarily bad for them. The EV market as a whole is labored with, with kind of issues coming from China, but if we get tariffs in, ideally that can kind of buffer us a little bit, unless the Chinese really can produce even at a profit, considering uh, tariffs laid on. Folks, stay right there. We'll be right back up with Steve Rhodes.